It's time to talk some hoops. It's Basketball Jones, giving you behind-the-scenes, in-depth looks each week at a special guest from the basketball world. We know you're ready for basketball to be back, but no one's jonesing for it like your host, Mark Jones. And hello, everybody. I'm Mark Jones, and welcome to another edition of the Basketball Jones. And before we get started here today, I want to give a quick shout out to the first responders out there. Our first responders continuing to do a courageous job in uh, helping those who are in much need right now in this COVID-19 world that we're living in. The ICU workers, the doctors, the nurses, nurses, and the first responders and policemen as and firemen as well. All of you, our prayers and thoughts with you. Keep up the great work. Um, hey, today we got a special guest for you out there on the Basketball Jones. We're going to call it a little bit of a family time as we bring in the play-by-play voice, analyst voice of the Toronto Raptors, my brother, Paul Jones. Uh, Paul, thanks a lot for joining us on the Basketball Jones here today as uh, as we get ready to ramp up here in about, uh, well, we got basketball on the 30th. So in about 15 days, we're going to start running a few. I was wondering when I was going to get on the show and just like, <laughs> you know, I had to, I mean, somebody, I had to go right to the top to get to Albert yeah, or yeah. get to our producer, Devin or something. But yeah. uh, I, I like what you guys got going here. Great to be on. And yeah, we are ramping up. And I, my situation is a little bit different from yours, Mark, being up in Canada uh, where, uh, the Canadian government uh, was so strict with their, um, you know, with their limitations around each phase going through uh, the whole COVID-19 process that the Raptors couldn't even come home, so to speak, to wow. train here. Uh, the facility was open. Uh, there were maybe a handful of guys here, four or five that would work out individually, but they couldn't get the whole team here. So they actually went to uh, Florida Gulf Course University in, in right. Fort Myers and and started to work out from there. So our situation's a little bit different. And, um, you know, there's a lot of great fans in Toronto here that are really missing basketball. And and uh, the, the, the energy of Scotiabank Arena is going to be something that I'm sure the team will miss once it gets into playing in the playoffs. Yeah, man. Like uh, that has always been one of the biggest assets of the Toronto Raptors with Jurassic Park outside Scotiabank Arena and the great ambiance and atmosphere and everything has been totally neutralized now. When you look at the yeah. great home court record of the Milwaukee Bucks, the best record in the NBA prior to the season suspension back on March 11th, um, Lakers, you know, with the best record in the West, everything's neutralized now. So it's going to be very intriguing to see um teams and how they play what kind of energy perhaps they can create when we start playing again in Orlando let's start with the uh let's start with the 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 team in the eastern conference the Milwaukee Bucks um had one of the best home records in the NBA i think only second to the uh Philadelphia 76ers um one of the questions about Milwaukee and you got a really close look at them last year in the playoffs when they played you guys uh in the conference finals um, when you think about their prospects moving forward, everybody knows about the MVP type year that Giannis is having. But what about that number two guy, Chris Middleton? He seems to be the guy that people kind of question as to whether he can be good enough for them to get over the hump. Well, and that's and that's just it, Mark. We saw that last year. And, you know, when Milwaukee took that 2 nothing lead last year, a lot of people were saying, well, the Warriors and the Bucks, it's going to be a great series. And I was like, slow your roll <laughs> yeah milwaukee yeah. stole the first game toronto deserved to win that first game but you know in the in the words of our man bill parcells you are what your record says you are but milwaukee stole the home game they won the second game and all they've done is hold serve and, and Kawhi leonard had the great warren sap line after game two right when they said so Kawhi, you know what what, what happens now where do you go from here and he kind of very dryly said <laughs> to the go airport. back to Toronto for game to the three. airport. <laughs> <laughs> we go back and yeah. and that was where it changed, Mark, because Kawhi took on the challenge of guarding Giannis. Right. And it was as if Nick Nurse says, Okay, we know that dude can beat us. Let's see if the other guys can. And one of those other guys was Chris Middleton, who was also guarding Kawhi Leonard. And I thought that took a lot out of him. And he did not have a great series. 
Yeah, he he did not. And and some of the other guys that they had had depended on over the course of the regular season were up and down. Uh, you know, uh, Eric Bledsoe for one could couldn't make shots. Um, Middleton had a tough time. I mean, Brogdon was good, but they just you can't be. In, we know this. In the biggest games, your best players have to be your best players. Exactly. And Toronto was able to neutralize Middleton, and um, you know, and and but on the other hand, Toronto's supporting cast around Kawhi was very, very good. Yeah, Mid- Middleton this year. In fairness to him, during the regular season, anyway, the sample size is pretty significant so far. He's a 50-40-90 guy, just under 50% yeah. from the field, 49.9%, having a career year. And, uh, you know, when I was speaking with him a little bit earlier this year, he feels like he's uh, a little bit more of a, a playmaker this year. And, um, you know, Coach Budenheiser, uh, uh, Coach Bud at one point last year, wasn't fond of some of the mid-range shots that he was taking because Milwaukee likes to jack a lot of threes. But this year he's actually – um, I think kind of bent his strategy a little bit at times to accommodate Middleton, who is one of the best uh, yeah. you know, mid-range shooters and scorers in the game. Let's go out west to the Lakers and, and talk about one of the major developments with them. Um, you know, they still got the core with uh, LeBron and AD who have been keeping ready through this uh, pandemic. But uh, how much of an impact do you think that Rondo's injury is going to make in the short term anyway. And I say short term because it's six to eight weeks with the broken hand. They're anticipating he'll be back for the playoffs and and healthy. Um, I think it it, it robs them of a chance to to put their chemistry together. And I Mm -hmm. think that's one of the big things that some of the other teams have uh, going forward, like Toronto or Milwaukee. They've, they've got familiarity, they've got chemistry. And, and, and we know Rondo is a guy that, uh, does a great job of stabilizing a team, getting right. them into their offense, getting them into their sets. Um, you know, when LeBron's off the floor, or or gives them another ball handler when LeBron is on the floor. So, yeah. I, I think in the short term it hurts them. It hurts the fact that you know he can't uh, he can't get out there, uh, mesh with LeBron, uh, you know, mesh with the, the rest of the guys, develop that chemistry. Because remember now, Mark, we've had an off season. You know, yeah. you talked about it off the top of the show with COVID-19 hitting, uh, you know, it hit us on March 9th. That's the day that we got back from Utah after playing yeah. the Jazz with Rudy Gobert being the first guy. And we've we've had so we've had April, May, June and half of July. We were that's, just talking that's a whole with our off guy. Season. Yeah, that's an offseason. We were just yeah. talking I've been to called the game since team. March 7th in San Francisco. Yeah, March. Yeah. And, and I saw you that weekend and we were. We were uh, March 9th in in uh, March 8th in Utah. So yeah. um, it, it, they need that time together. And I think the fact that Rondo won't have that initially is going to hurt them. And then, Mark, he's got to come back and get on a moving train. Those right. guys have been ramping up for five or six weeks with seeding games and early rounds of the playoffs. I mean, he's a vet. He may be able to do it, but it's it's putting it all together, I think, that's going to be the, the key. Yeah. And they're already missing – Avery Bradley. So from a defensive standpoint, Rondo and Bradley, they kind of, they're really good at setting the tone and tenor for that Lakers team, which is a top 10 defensive team in efficiency. Um, You know, I was looking at and listening to um, one of our colleagues at ESPN recently talk about Rondo and how in over a hundred playoff games, bro, he's averaging just under 15 points a game. And I want to say, seven, eight, eight assists or nine assists. I mean, at playoff time, we've seen, they talk about playoff Rondo being a phenomenon. It's, it's a real thing, right? Let me, let me throw this at you. Rondo had the Chicago Bulls up two nothing on the Boston Celtics, yeah. right? Before he, before he suffered an injury and it, it went downhill from there. And, you know, he, the word is he's, he's he can be a tough teammate. He can be difficult right. to coach, but that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. Winning justifies it all, right? And right. and I, I I think that I think they're going to miss him, and I think they're going to miss his experience because you remember, AD's only been to the second round. Uh, you know they got some experience with Danny Green, but other than that, there's a lot of guys there that need they need the boost, they need the help from Rondo. They they have experience, but they need a, a you know a leading figure, and I think he supplies that for them. Yeah. 
Hey, you know, we talked about Milwaukee, talked about the Lakers, um, everything in wake of what's happened since Adam Silver suspended the remainder of the NBA regular season back on March the 11th, a real kind of twilight zone night that we all still remember vividly. What seems to get lost in all of the news reports about the COVID rates in Florida amongst the phase one, phase two in the respective NBA cities across the NBA is the fact that, hey, folks, look at us. We're the Toronto Raptors. We yes. actually are the reigning champs. <laughs> well, what's, what's the vibe and what's the mood up in Toronto? Because it's so disjointed. Um, do the guys on the team kind of feel like, hey, we're going to Orlando. Other teams have what we already have got, so they're coming for us. Is it – do you sense any kind of that mentality? I know they were they were right across the peninsula for me, about an hour and 20 from my doorstep at Florida Gulf Coast uh, University working out, and you chronicled and documented it. Their existence has been a little bit different compared to the other 29 NBA teams. Well, Mark, they, they came into the season with the champs, as the champs, with that ring wearing it as a chip on their shoulder. Hmm. Because people, I mean, some of our, our brethren in the U.S. media were picking the Raptors to miss the playoffs. Right. Finish eighth. And th <laughs> they looked and they said, wait a minute. You know, I love that there's a commercial, I think, with uh, AT&T where Magic says the show times in the 310. And Paul George says, well, the 213. Yeah. And I'm like, yo, the championship's in the 416. Yeah. L Larry's living in 416. And they have they have this. Oh, you don't you thought last year was a fluke. You, you don't yeah. think we can do this. And Mark, they're 46 and 18. Yeah. Second best record in the in the East, third best overall. And they have lost, if you look at the top five teams in man games lost to injury, Toronto's in the top five. And none of the other four are sniffing the playoffs. The Blazers, Trailblazers, are ninth, and they're in that top five. So they're at a point where, I mean, everybody was upset because when COVID-19 hit, and the Raptors were rolling. They'd come off right. a 15 game win streak and they were just ramping it back up again and you shut it down. But now they're going to camp and these seating games with the attitude that, hey man, we're still the champs. And and you guys still aren't talking about it. Right. Everybody's right. still talking about Milwaukee and LA and look out for Boston. And now Joel yeah. Embiid has Simmons back healthy. And they're like, yo, hey, we. All right, don't worry. We'll show yeah. you. Mark, you and I have talked about this on yeah. camera. Toronto's got a lot of guys without people in the stands. These are some of the guys you'd pick if you were balling out on the schoolyard. At the park, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and the type of um, Nick Nurse, to his credit, runs a, a very almost egalitarian uh, offense, a lot of motion, a lot of flow uh, based on rhythm and, and, and vibe and – you know, guys, ball movement, player movement, and it's, it's worked out well so far. They're, I, I want to say the Raptors are almost top 10 in both defense, uh, offensive and defensive efficiency. And, you know, the, the, the only thing that kind of concerns me with Toronto is, <clears throat> pardon me, Paul, and I know that it kind of plays into, um, you know, the COVID and the climate implications. I mean, I can't tell you how many times during – the shutdown. I saw videos of Serge Ibaka doing wind sprints in his downtown his condo. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you can't be doing suicides in your condo and say you're in great shape. I know Serge got a body like a Greek god. I mean, the guy's shredded. You can do laundry on his abs, but um, I don't know that maybe Toronto has a little bit further to go in terms of fitness and basketball skills. And I know some of the guys I've heard some of them who stuck around say that they hadn't touched a basketball in a long time. What, what do you make of that? Well, um, I, I agree. And I, and I think they're, I think they're from the sounds of it at practice now and what's going on, they're working very hard to do that. And Mark, uh, this is, I think one of the advantages that they have as a veteran team and Nick nurse, you're right. His philosophy is uh, move the ball. When you catch it, you got about a second, shoot it, pass it, drive it, do not hold it. And that's the way they played last year when Kawhi was, out in the 22 games of load management and when he was in a game and on the bench that's the way they played as you said an equal opportunity offense right and they have veterans 
I mean, there's to, to Nick Nurse, and I've teased him about this getting on the on the charter to the plane. Is there air, anything more comforting than running your elbow series when you enter <laughs> the ball to Mark Gasol at the elbow? Like all this, he's holding it up over his head. All that's missing yeah. is the Gold Trotter music because he's passing it yeah. behind his head to people. Yeah. And you've got Lowry. You and got Pascal. the split butt on the side. Yeah. So yeah. I, the fact that they're not in great basketball shape, I think will be experience will overcome some of that and and they're probably getting a lot of good reps in right now but don't sleep on this team and i i know yeah. that i sound like the you know the 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 beating heart homer but i've just seen so much bad basketball from this team 10 15 years ago that right. i know what good basketball looks like and it and it looks like the stuff that they're doing right now yeah i um i know they said they got a lot of good work in across the peninsula over at uh, Fort Myers, Florida, uh, not too far from my doorstep. And uh, uh, I know they're familiar with the area. I know Nick is because his, his wife played volleyball. Roberta played volleyball at uh, Florida Gulf Coast University. So uh, I know that area really well. It's comfortable. They got it on lockdown. They got all their work done and, and they're ready to go. And I don't think, Paul, to switch gears again a little bit, I don't think there was a team in the entire NBA that made a more impressive statement in arriving yes. to Lake Buena Vista, Florida, AKA Air Orlando, um, in their bus than the Toronto Raptors with the big, bold statement, Black Lives Matter on the side of their bus. Uh, very well done by the Raptors Brain Trust, uh, Messiah Jiri, uh, a very socially uh, conscious uh, general manager, um, as a black man, led the Raptors to the championship last year, pulled the trigger on a lot of pivotal deals that got them to that point. Not um, popular at times either, Mark, but yeah, hey yeah. Man, it's, it, it, ain't, it ain't about a popularity contest. Yep, yeah. and, and it's difficult to go against consensus sometimes and that thinking. But uh, what do you make of the, the, the movement that's happening right now league-wide? And, you know, I just spoke with um, a member of um, the NBA training com uh, community, a guy that works out, you know, 50 NBA players, elite players. And he was of the feeling that surprisingly, maybe they shouldn't be playing right now because guys will be distracted, won't have the same type of pointed messaging with regards to uh, the movement as opposed to the moment. We got to make it a movement, not just a moment. And that there might be a little loss in momentum. Uh, wh what are your thoughts on the guys using their platform versus not playing because it was really in question at one point. Yeah. No, you know what? I think they got to play Mark uh, because yeah. that's what, that's where your platform was built. And, you know, we, we, uh, we saw in uh, NASCAR uh, a few bars of lift every voice at the end of yeah. a national anthem. The black and, national anthem. Yeah. And, and yeah. we're going to have black lives matter on the court. And I, I do agree that, going back to play takes a little bit of their focus away and it takes everybody's general focus away because they're mm -hmm. watching sports when the George Floyd uh, murder happened and let's call it what it is a modern yeah. day lynching. Sure. Um, it would have been in the middle of the finals and somebody said, well, what a platform that would have been. And I said, no, because we would have had the same thing. Some players would have known, would have spoken about it. You get a little chatter about it. And then the next question is, okay, so how do you win game three? Right. So th that's always going to go on. So I, I think they can use their platform now to keep it a movement, Mark, and not a moment. Uh, and, and I think you're going to see that once the games start up. The Raptors, Patrick McCaw was saying today that the Raptors have actually formed a little committee with a few players. Wow, that's coaches, great. That's and, awesome. As about, you know, about to how do we keep the message going? And, and, you know, Mark Gasol said on the Zoom call today, he said, you know, don't look at America. Racism is all over the world. Sure. He said, and here's a guy who's from Spain, who spent time in Memphis as a high school. Like, he says, this is not, this is not a localized thing. So this movement has to be continuous. And, and I like the fact that um, as the only NBA team outside of the U.S., the Raptors are making it their business to, to continue to hold up a mirror to yeah. everybody. Everybody, yeah. not just not just basketball people, but everybody else around the world. So I agree. I agree that it does take a little bit away in terms of playing again, and you're going to see, you know, guys focusing on their on their craft. But when they're not doing that, Mark, 
you know that they're going to be out. And a guy like LeBron has made the NBA socially conscious. Yeah, yeah. And he's made it okay for those guys that don't have that money to say, well, I got my money. He's made it okay for those other guys sure. um, in the rank and file to say that. Why? Because I'm with you. I'm supporting you. Yeah, he, he's eliminated that uh, almost fear factor of corporate right. America pulling right. the plug on you because you say something, quote unquote, controversial. I like to counter. And, you know, you and I both are behind the microphone during games. And you know what? Hang on one second. It just got real dark here in Miami. Hang on one second. <laughs> uh -oh. We'll turn this light off. It got real dark. It's it's time for that afternoon thunderstorm. So I got dark. Three, right. I it's lost about my three o'clock Eastern, yeah. right? About three. Yeah, it's about that rain, rain for twenty minutes, and you'll be good. <laughs> so, uh, what I was saying was, you know, I I hear people talk about, and I get you know messages on social media saying, "Oh, why do you have to talk about that? Why do you want to talk about race? Why are you bringing up, you know, uh, Sterling Brown?" I'm like, "Hey, listen." Black Lives Matter should not be debatable. It should be assumed. But we're in a space in this world, unfortunately, regrettably, where, you know, it's people debated. They like to counter all lives matter. I like to say, you know, black, all lives matter can't be true until black lives matter. It's not like when Jesus was on the mount, he didn't say blessed are the rich. He said blessed are the poor because, you know, you know the rich are going to be okay, right? Right. So there's going right. to be... You always have to look out for the pushback. That's how I feel. There's going to be pushback. There are going to be people that don't want to hear it because they're telling on themselves. One, I say. Yeah. And they feel uncomfortable because the truth makes people feel uncomfortable sometimes. And if I use the example, I got a Bucks and Celtics game coming up when we resume. If you are not talking about the Sterling Brown story, when he was brutalized by police a year and a half ago, then you're missing the story. Right. Because that incident is still pertinent inside that Bucks locker room. I know those guys talk about it. And Sterling Brown is still in litigation suing the Milwaukee Police Department for it. If you're not talking about social justice at various points of this, you're not being true to the athletes that you're covering. So that's my you're, takeaway on, yeah. on what's happening right now. And like I said, it's not a political issue. It's a human issue. Yes. Just the same way we would tell a story about um, odds that a guy overcame to make it to the NBA or to get into a certain college to make it to the league or an injury. It's the same human drama, the human condition that we speak about. It just happens to be about color and race. Well, these guys don't do don't don't play basketball every minute of the day. They are people outside of this. And and Sterling Brown wrote a really nice piece in the in the Players Tribune about it. And I, I agree with you. This this is, you know, I, I those people that you said, Mark, that are telling on themselves, they're the yeah. ones rolling their eyes now. You know, we're oh, yeah, yeah. We're five, six weeks out from George Floyd <laughs> and they're rolling their eyes, going, yeah. okay, enough. No, no, yeah. not enough. It, yeah. it, it, it won't be enough till we get total change. And in speaking to some of the people that have been through this, and I, I, I call him uh, my grandfather. I'm, I'm fortunate to have the, the sure. eminent Wayne Embry around this franchise in Toronto. One of the most and, esteemed guys in the league. Yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah. And, and, you know, Wayne and, and tells me the story about his wife and Oscar, Oscar Robertson's wife, uh, you know, Terry and Yvonne going down to be, to ride the bus, the Freedom Riders. And Wayne says, you're not going. And she says, oh, well, try and stop me. And he went through it in the 60s. And then we went through it in the 90s with 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 Rodney King. And I have kids that I was teaching at that point uh, messaging me now. They're in their 30s and 40s. And here we are in 2020, 30 years later, doing it again. So it's not something that's isolated. And it's something that we have to continue to try and change. And I guess where I take heart now is, hearing somebody like Wayne Embry and, and speaking to guys like Dominique Wilkins and saying the diversity, the inclusivity of the people asking for change right. seems to be making a difference. Now, we can't that, let that die either. And if that yeah. means, as you said, Mark, we have to make it uncomfortable for those people say, hey, wait a minute, you were with me five, six weeks ago. You still with me? 
Yeah. You st- are you still you still on board with this? Because yeah. it hasn't changed yet. So yeah. And and that and that comes through the vehicle that we have as basketball. Yeah, that that's a great point. I um down here in Miami in Fort Lauderdale where I live, um, I've been to three different Black Lives Matter marches and um to see the rainbow of colors of people that have been participating in the movement, uh white people, black people, brown people, Asian, Hispanic, all across, uh, you know, Arabic, um, all across the rainbow. It's been a real beautiful thing. And, um, you know, it kind of leads me to think about some of the messages that the guys are going to put on the back of the jerseys. It was interesting to um, hear LeBron say he was just going to keep his regular jersey name on the back, which I totally understand, Paul, because... LeBron doesn't need to do anything symbolic. No. He he lives it. He breathes it. He speaks it. He's about it, as the kids say. Um, I love some of the other messages. Kyle Korver saying that he was going to have Black Lives Matter on um, the back of his jersey when playing for the Milwaukee Bucks. Kyle has always been a great, I was great say, ally, is he uh, not, a real enlightened is he not- guy. Yeah. Mark, is he not the epitome of being educated on the subject? Yeah. Uh, yeah. When you look about look at what he wrote last year and saying, geez, I, I didn't understand that I had these privileges. Now I do. And that's yeah. the value of educating people. Yeah. I um thinking about Jimmy Butler, who said he doesn't want anybody's name on the back. Uh, he doesn't want a slogan or his name because he is basically saying that I don't think I'm above any other person of color. I'm with the masses, and, and that's a unique message, too. Uh, I was speaking with uh, one of your guys, Kyle Lowry, recently. He said that uh, his message was going to be education reform. What do, you, what do you make of the messaging and the fact that the league picked out those names? Some guys are going with it, some aren't, and some are kind of in between. I like the fact that Adam Silver is, has, uh, has given and and in talking obviously with Michelle Roberts and Chris Paul and people like that, they've given the players choices. That's all you ask for a choice. you not, right. not a, not a top down authoritarian thou shall. And they have choices and guys will do, do what what's comfortable for them and know that they have the freedom without fear of, you know, with impunity, without fear of right. punishment or reprisal or retribution to speak up. And, 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 you know, a lot of people want to go back to the time when, when Michael Jordan was, uh, you know, doing his thing in his heyday and he didn't speak up. Yeah. That was a different time. Yeah. That was when the generational money was first coming in and you didn't, you, you weren't sure that you wanted to cut that off. Let me get set first. And Michael's done a lot since then, but people keep reflecting. Yeah, back he's on changed. That era. Yeah, yeah, he's actually he's very different. He's oh. transformed a lot. Yeah. Oh, but but he doesn't get credit for that because yeah. people only look back and look. Without Michael Jordan doing what he did in terms of securing that idea of, because Mark, let's face it, the bottom line is economics. Yeah, without, you got to get your bag, man, and keep it. Yeah. With without Michael securing that for the likes of LeBron and everybody else that came after him then this doesn't happen. I mean, look at guys like Kaepernick and Ali that gave up that economic, uh, um, you know, that, that, that economic stability right. to put their cause on the line. And they're going to be on the right side of history, which is great. I hope they're on the right side of the line when, when the bank opens too, because they gave up a lot. And, and the fact is that when Jordan did what he did, it allowed all these other guys to make that generational money and then speak up and say, you know what, I'm secure. So here's what I have to say. Right. Right. Hey, um, uh, a couple more things before we uh, wrap it up just real quick, man. It was, it was good to um, read and talk with, uh, yourself with um, Eric Collins, yes. play-by-play voice of the Charlotte Hornets, Megan McPeak, as to, um, you know, the fact that we are a very select select group as it pertains hey. to the NBA in terms of black play-by-play voices. and um, It's like the old line from Bum Phillips. I wouldn't say he's in a class by himself, but it don't take long to do attendance, right? Yeah, yeah, it's man. Us. That's it. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it really speaks to our dedication to the craft, man. And, um, you know, I, I think that, uh, 
you probably feel along the same lines I do. I won't speak for you directly, but man, I'm, I'm always looking to uh, mentor uh, who might be next or who might want to be next because um, I still think that, you know, and the league has admitted that it's not great, but the league is continuing to put efforts into diversifying the look of the league um, in terms of broadcast, in terms of management. Uh, we've had two general managers who are black hired recently in the last couple of months in uh, Detroit and Chicago. So, you know, nothing's perfect. Nothing's ever going to be perfect. But I think the NBA at least has a great consciousness about um, equality and um, opportunity. If, if the if the world is looking to run the marathon of equality, 26 miles, 385 yards, or, or 42 kilometers here in Canada, then the NBA's run 10 miles. Yeah, man. But they still have a long way to go. And I'll tell you, they're way ahead of baseball. Baseball's run a mile. The NFL's run half a mile. Hockey's gone around the block. Yeah. Like there's there's still a long way to go for some of those others. And I'll give the NBA credit, but as you said, there's still a long way to go. And there's still it's it's a continuous uh it's a continuous movement that has to happen. And and, and it's great. I'm I'm with you. Megan McPeak came to me out of Humber College and we we had wow. a chance to talk and and um uh, you know and, and I and I and I know I do speak for you when um, you know, our, our late father who, you know, passed away a year ago and, um, you know, my mo mom, our mom is still here. Um, they were of the attitude, man, we, we don't care how rough the water is, bring that ship in. Yeah, you man. Know? And, and it's no secret that, that dad was a Jackie Robinson fan because Jackie persevered. He knew all the yeah. stuff that was going to be thrown at him. And unless he physically had to defend himself, he shook that off and he kept going. Yeah. And, and, and I, and I think, you know, to you, uh, who have inspired me uh, and I people don't know the story of I got into the business after you did when you sent the ladder down for me crazy huh yeah and, and yeah. you know to people like Eric Collins and we got a few people out there Megan McPeak Carlin Gay is doing some stuff with FIBA uh, you know the young the young black writers Gil McGregor's son in Charlotte like it, yeah. it's good to see that it's good to see that that that, that it's changing and let's face it it's our kids it's your kids. It's the next generation that has to continue to make that push for change. Yeah. Um, it was interesting in the story. Mark Spears wrote a great article on the under. Great story. And he asked, uh, what would you say to the next generation? And I said, you know, I cited that story in the anecdote about how two weeks before um, I, it was early June of 1990. First week of June, I sat down with my boss at, at uh, TSN, the sports network I was working at in Toronto. And I sat down with my boss over lunch and had previously asked him to listen to my demo tape on play by play. Look me in the eye and he said, I don't think you're ready. I don't think you're good enough. And then I kind of shook my head, nodded my head. And two weeks later, I had an offer from ESPN and ABC to be a play by play guy. So I think the message is, hey, People are going to tell you you're not ready. People are going to tell you you're not good enough. People are going to tell you you don't have it. You just got to know that you do. And especially as it pertains to uh, black folks, sometimes the people evaluating us don't even know what they're watching. Right. They don't right. understand uh, the culture element of sports. So... I tell people who ask me, I tell young black kids who ask me, do your thing, man. Don't listen to anybody. Keep plowing ahead. It's like Hugh Jones told us, our dad, man. Yeah, yeah. He said, be twice as good. Be three times as good. Be better. So you Don't, just have yeah. to, man. Yeah. <laughs> There's no other way, you know? Be better. Be better. Yeah. And, 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 and keep swinging. You know, like yeah. we, people, know, some, of, some of the people listening may know the story. The dad was a, dad was a high school boxer in Jamaica. And uh, hey, man, you got to answer that bell. You, yep. you, there's just uh, stopping, quitting, not persevering is not an option. And mm -hmm. and uh, I, and I and I think that's where we got that from from mom and dad. And and that's the stuff that we're trying to instill in in our kids and and you know all the all the young black kids that want to get into our business. And I I tell people. Uh, you know, they asked me, I said, nothing is beneath you. I started carrying the bag for you when you were reporting at TSN, yeah. you know, like, Hey, whatever it is, 
it's like it's like professional school being a, do- a doctor or a lawyer the hardest part is getting in yeah. once you're in even if you come last in your class you're busting that door you're still a doctor so just get yourself in and 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 nothing is beneath you learn everything make yourself versatile and um you know it's it's uh it's just something a message that we have to keep keep telling everybody yeah hey paul um Let's uh, hit a couple of quick things before we wrap it up here. Um, Nikola Jokic had visa problems, had testing issues, whatever you want to call them. The dude got his South Beach Miami body on. He's lost like 20, 30 pounds, looks great. What do you make of him being a part of the Nuggets, having a shot in the West? A couple of guys, Mark Gasol, too, for the Raptors. I mean, yeah. Norman, Powell, Norman Powell says he looks like a Barcelona soccer player. We're, we're on total body watch again, man. It's like <laughs> and, in the off season, right? Here's the other thing. Here's the thing, though, I would I would hope with guys like Jokic and, and Gasol. They're used to playing a certain way with a certain body. There's going to be an adjustment phase for them. Hmm. But if that'll make Jokic better defensively, because they they like to to put him in pick and roll and switch and go at him. If it's going to make him a little bit better defensively and a little bit quicker and and uh, and 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 able to kind of hold his own at that end of the court, his offensive skill is without question. But yeah. it's the other end. And um, I mean, I, I I like the Nuggets. Um, they they hopefully have gained some experience after a couple of tough years, finishing ninth, losing yeah. Game Seven at home last year. Hopefully they've got some experience and they can make some noise. Yeah, I think I think they're still waiting on Gary Harris to make the trip down to Orlando too. So much still to be, you know, cleared up when it comes to guys who actually yeah. have made it. And um, you know, obviously they're the number three seed in the Western Conference going into the resumption of play. So they they should have a a shot. They would match up, interestingly enough, with the guy I want to talk about next, um, James Harden, man. Uh, the Houston Rockets, James, just making it to the bubble recently in the last 24 hours. Um, you know, whenever you see that a guy didn't make the trip on the team plane there, people make the obvious assumptions about uh, a COVID implication. Uh, we don't have confirmation about that. But Russ admitted that he was positive. Um, the, the Rockets, they haven't been able to practice the way they usually play because right. without James Harden, it just doesn't translate. It's not like Austin Rivers can go out there and play the role of James Harden. Nobody can, really. Right, right. Um, you know, what do you make of Harden, the NBA's leading scorer, going in? Look, uh, we talked about how we've had an off season, and this was the time of the year, playoff time, where um, because he doesn't really believe in load management. I remember talking to him. He said, "Man, I love to hoop," and, right? And, and James is going to play, but he's had some time off now, and if he's able to be in, he's lost some weight. If he's able to be in basketball shape, the Rockets could be a dangerous team because let's face it, the way the NBA is now, Mark, sometimes the best offensive team, the best defensive team is the one that has the most points. Yeah. And Houston yeah. playing small with that five out style and, and, and threes and layups for them. I mean, they, yeah. they average four shots in the mid range per game. Unbelievable. Four, that's it. It's yeah. either it's either in the paint. And Russ takes them all. <laughs> That's right. Russ is the only one with the green light for that. And yeah. and if, if James Harden is healthy and rested at a time when he's normally running on fumes and running out of gas, the Rockets are going to be dangerous. Yeah. I know at one point he was doing some pretty good uh, workouts and training down here in South Florida. So, so much to be uh, – Found out still when we resume on the 30th of July. One last mention here. I don't know if you saw the TBT, the basketball tournament. I did. I did. An incredible finish last night um, with the, I guess we'll informally call them the Marquette University alumni, Travis Diener, hitting the big corner three to win the $1 million winner-take-all tournament. It was so good to watch in terms of, the basketball, the quality of basketball was great. I liked watching yeah. overseas elite Joe Johnson still doing what ISO Joe does. And then on top of that, the fact that they were able to pull it off, you know, having a bubble, having teams inside the bubble and being able to limit their positive tests and pretty much carry on via the way it was planned says a lot about how this thing might be able to be managed on an NBA level as we look forward to the next month. 
you got to be diligent. I mean, yeah. the guys in the bubble have to, you know, have to be disciplined, have to be uh, diligent in in their pursuit of health and and maintaining the integrity of of the bubble. I mean, there's yeah. there's no other way to say it. And yeah. um, to watch, what you think? What you think of the games? I love the games. I love the games. And you know, it, it's something that we, you and I have talked about. You could hear Charlie Parker yelling, "Double drag, double drag!" <laughs> like you can hear all the play calls. You yeah. can hear the chatter out there, and I and I love that. And it's it it'll be interesting to see what it's like uh, at the next level uh, with with the NBA. But uh, it was great basketball. It was really competitive. Um, I love the ending. You know the yeah. the, the Elam ending. I, I love that. You know, you and I have talked about that for a while now. Do you you like the Elam ending in terms of? Maybe in the NBA, there's got to be a place for it somewhere. Well, because, Mark, you know, we've had kids like our kids play volleyball. And it's like volleyball and baseball. Those are games where the clock doesn't help you out. You right. need to finish the game. Yeah. Yeah. You know, right. It's like playing yeah. out on the blacktop. You got to hey, do man, it. Yeah. When it's when it's when the game's up to seven and it's six, three, it's like life and death. I'm not letting you get that seventh point. I'm you. You're going to have to hit that thing from center because if you come in the lane, I'm going to hack you. I'm going to foul you. And I, I kind of like that. I wish the NBA would go to that, um, you know, it, it, on a trial basis, even for in, in the G League to see the way it works. And I like that because now you've got to finish the game. You can't let the clock finish it for you. Right. Right. Hey, Paul. Thanks a lot for joining us, man. We're going to wrap it up. And uh, wow, it's it's uh, you know. Eastern time, it's 3.42, and it's starting to storm. Those guys up the turnpike for me about three hours are figuring out that Orlando is actually really hot and sticky and miserable in the middle of July, and it rains every day between like 3 and 5 o'clock, and then it'll get sunny and hot again. So i um, going to be heading up there. I know uh, you're probably going to be um, covering the games from the studio up there in Toronto. Uh, it's going to be a great journey, man. And thanks a lot for joining us here on the uh, Basketball Jones Jones today. <laughs> Pleasure, man. Pleasure. Yeah. Hey, don't forget, we got more great uh, programming on hallpassmedia.com. We got Pickup Game featuring Seth Greenberg every Monday afternoon. Basketball Jones every Tuesday on Basketball Every Noon. And don't forget our Sports Business Classroom featuring Bo Estes live every Thursday afternoon on Hall Pass Hoops, hallpassmedia.com. For Paul Jones, I'm Mark Jones saying, hey, when you've reached the end of your basketball rope, just tie a knot and hang, folks. See you later. See you next week.